morning. Um, today's reading comes from Philipp, <laughs> Philippa, <laughs> Philippians, and it's on the uh, Church Bible, page 1189. It's chapter 4, verse 1 to 9. Lord, I just ask that you open up our hearts as we pronounce your word today. Thank you. Therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for are my joy and crown. That is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. I plead with Eudia and I plead with Cynthia to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, Help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, Present your requests to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guide your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. I'm going to invite Dean to come up now. Now, I'm sure he'd agree it's quite a responsibility to bring a talk to the service and uh, Dean's been listening to God and trying to hear what he says and putting time in but Dean's responsibility ends now and the responsibility passes to us to open our hearts and our minds to hear what God is saying to take away what he's saying and, and think about it during the week and maybe in our home groups and and allow it to sort of infiltrate our lives so um, just just pray for Dean and for ourselves Father, we just thank you for the word you've given Dean this morning, for the time he's spent, uh, for the way he's opened his heart to you. Just pray, Lord, that as he brings your word to us this morning, that we would open our hearts, that we would take away what it is that you say to each one of us this morning, to dwell on it, Lord, and allow it to touch us and to change our lives. Through the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Right, there. How's your week? Ha great. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord. I will say it again, rejoice. How is your life at the moment? Do you feel there's much to be joyful about? Can you rejoice? Or are you going through a tough time? Is it hard to rejoice for you? What do we mean by rejoice and rejoicing? It means to feel and show great joy or delight. Are we doing that or have we just got our church faces on? <laughs> you know, what are we like at Christ Church? Everything's fine, but it isn't. It's a tough passage. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice always. How is it possible when things are tough and difficult? How can you rejoice when things are like that? When things are going well, it's often much easier to be joyful. And when they aren't, they can be a real challenge. As I say, we often can put a little church face on. And actually, we can sometimes be like that at work as well. How can Paul, writing from a Roman prison and living in poverty, say, rejoice always? 
How is that possible? Is he for real? <clears throat> Where does such joy come from? He's in prison. In fact, he's been in prison many a time. He's been shipwrecked, he's been flogged, he's been stoned. And he says, I say it again, rejoice always. How is that possible? As I said, Paul, in terms of the context, Paul was in prison and he had just been sent a gift from the Philippians church. And in a way, what we've been doing is a season is kind of, everything's kind of fitting together. We've read the book of Luke, and then we moved on to the book of Acts. And then we saw and heard about what Paul got up to and how the Lord had transformed his life by his appearance and by the power of the Holy Spirit. And really, this passage is about looking at a little bit of Acts and kind of sort of magnifying them. And Paul is writing a letter to the Philippian church. So really, Paul's letters almost come back to what, what we would have read in the book of Acts. It's just in a little bit more, perhaps, detail. So Matt Beer, a couple of weeks ago, read a little bit of the context of Acts 16. As if you can remember, um, Paul set um, a slave girl free. She could make a lot of money for her owners by prophesying. And this slave girl kept on telling people that Paul and Silas were Jesus carriers. That's what Matt said. I think that's a great phrase, that, Jesus carriers. He said, these guys, they're Jesus carriers. And they know how you can be saved. They've got the knowledge. Well, we know he set her free, and, um, and basically all things kicked off at that point. He ended up in prison. What I quite like about that story, and I'm not going too much about it in that book, um, Acts 16, is we know that the Lord did a miracle there. There was an earthquake, and the prison doors were flung open. And Paul remained in the cell, him and Silas. They'd been worshipping and praising the Lord. They weren't moaning and grumbling. They were actually giving thanks in prison. And those other prisoners actually were listening I'm not going to say too much about that, but there were people listening to Paul and Silas praising the Lord. And then we know that, well, I want to know why the other prisoners didn't escape. We know why Paul and Silas didn't, but what about the others? They didn't run away either. And then we know that the, the owner of the jail came scurrying in. Obviously, he was very distressed. He thought he was going to lose his life. And then he threw himself at Peter. Um, Paul's feet. How can I be saved? That's what he said. Well, I think those prisoners, or at least some of them, and the jailer, and his family, were part of this Philippians church. But Paul had already set up a little bit of that Philippians church. But there were some more recruits. They saw Jesus in action. And they saw some really quite powerful witnessing. And they said, we want that too. Anyway, that church, here's the Paul's um, in prison again. And this, actually, that's not, this is not the first time they've done this. And they sent him a gift. And they sent him a gift of money and encouragement. And so Paul writes this letter, this letter of the um, Philippians, to say thanks. Now, thank you for your love and your support. And he wanted them to encourage them because they were having a tough time also. That was a Roman colony where people, Roman soldiers went to retire. So very butch, men's men, if you want to um, call it that. Done lots of violence, and they think, great, I can retire now, and off they go. So we might go to Spain, they went to Philippians. Okay. And so they were having a tough time, because they were saying Jesus was Lord, and the Romans were saying Caesar's is Lord. It's a slight little digress, but I think it's a great story, that um, Acts 16. So, coming back to this passage, what is Paul saying about how to rejoice in all occasions? Where does that come from? In prison, in poverty, being persecuted, 
or half a dozen other things that may be happening in our lives, how can we rejoice in all occasions? How is that possible? Well, this is what I want to talk about this morning. And I think if you, I'm kind of taking an overview of Philippians. Philippians is a great book. But we can kind of say this, we can kind of point to this in all of Paul's letters. And I think the first thing is to remember who you are. I think that, if we want to rejoice always, we need to think about who are we? A lot of Christians have lost their real identity. They simply don't know who they really are. Or they've re- misplaced their real identity. And I think we can all do that. You know, if you have someone has not met you before, and they come up to you and ask this question, how would you answer it? Who are you? Who are you? Actually, who are you? How would you describe yourself? What would be the first thing that would come into your mind? Paul says in this and many other letters in the Bible, he says that his identity is in Christ Jesus. That's who he is. That's where his identity is. He knows who he is in Christ. So all these things might be going on around him, but he knows who he is. And he encourages all Christians to have their own identity in Jesus also. So where's our identity? Are we confident in our identity? Or is it in our properties? Men's thing is normally their job. So I went on a mission thing many, many years ago. And so I co-led a trip to Uganda. And so I met the other uh, leader. And we fell into our normal kind of stereotypes. So we met each other the first time, and effectively you say, who are you? In a kind of way around. And she described herself as um, a mother. And I described myself in terms of my job. So that's what men do. They are what their job is. Now, maybe things are a bit more blurred now in, the, in um, 2020. But in reality, it's often those two things, isn't it? It's your job. Perhaps it's your family. It's the team you support. And so I think that's where a lot of our identity is. But is it in Jesus? What's the ranking of that? Where, where are that list on this, 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 and this? Where's Jesus on our list of our, our identity? Is it the top? Or is he in relegation? In the middle of this letter, and I'm going to come back to this right at the end when I do perhaps do some ministry is um, a sort of a poem about Jesus. And that's chapter 2, 6 to 11. And this poem talks about Christ's humiliation and suffering and death and exaltation. And that he experienced all this for you and for me. Paul knew who Jesus was and he knew that his identity could be and it was in him. I think sometimes we and I struggle to rejoice always because we don't really get the good news. We don't always appreciate just how good the good news is. I'm hoping that the Bible course will help us unpack a little bit about that. Where do we fit in the Bible? Because it's not just about a book that was put together a couple of thousand years ago. It's a living thing, and we can be part of this story. God's kingdom come. Do we know what the good news is? 
Do we know just how good it is? As I say, I'll come back to that poem at the end. Paul in chapter 4 eight, tells us to med- meditate on whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, and if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Remembering who we are in Christ is an excellent start to help us to rejoice always. I want to ask Jenna to put the slide on. There's a lot of promises that the Lord says to us from his Bible. And it may be during the week. Um, there are, there's some notes outside and some questions at the back. But you might want to kind of rem- focus on, perhaps look these scriptures up. They're like little summaries I've done here. So you might want to kind of look at them in your Bible and, and spend some time thinking about what on earth do these scriptures mean? Because this is... Paul knew these for himself, and that's why his identity is in Christ. He knew these promises. You are God's image bearer. That is a piece of scripture we really all need to start spending time in and thinking, what does that mean, his image bearer? There'll be lots of things we'll talk about in a minute that take, doesn't want us to think we are his image bearer. God's fingerprints are all over us. He made us and he knew us before the beginning of creation. We are made in his image. We have some of his characteristics and his qualities. You are God's image bearer. Okay, number two. You are precious and loved by him. How amazing is that? You. This is why he's a personal saviour. And this is why Christianity isn't a religion like everyone else. Our Heavenly Father says, you. You are precious. You are loved by him. You are chosen in him before the creation of the world. Sometimes it's mind-boggling that, isn't it? How can there be all this history and time before I was born? How was that possible? And I didn't know anything about it. It's just an astonishing thing. I can never get over that. That's because I feel like I'm in the center of the universe, which I'm not. (laughs) You are chosen. Chosen, that's a choice. The Lord has done that. He chose you. You are, this is about you and Jesus. You are his holy sibling. You you and Jesus are brothers and sisters. We don't often feel holy. I mean, I don't. But he's saying we are his holy sibling. You are adopted. God is your father and you are his children. I was reading about this. Some people think that that is more important than justification by faith. It sounds a massively radical and even slightly dodgy sentiment. 
To be justified by faith is about being saved, putting your hope and trust in Jesus. They're saying that that's really, really important, but this tops it. Because salvation through faith is like a legal thing, whereas this is a relational thing. God as your father. Can you get over that? You are adopted. That is love. That's not legal. That's not a legal thing. That is love. You are adopted. He is your father. And you are his children. You're part of the family. That's where this holy sibling comes from. That's who you are. How about this? I can't get over this one. Dean, you are free from accusation and holy in his sight. Free from accusation. Our sins have been dealt with. We are forgiven. Indeed. You are holy in his sight. When he looks at you, you are holy in his sight. How often we... I think most of us in the church don't think that. We don't. We feel far, including myself, far from being holy. We, we're looking at our sins all the times and things that we mess up. Free from accusation, because Jesus is death on the cross. So even when I feel very weak. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Even in my weakness, that's a promise. I can do all things with Christ who strengthens me. And you are worth dying for. I think that's the last one. Oops, yeah. You are worth dying for. A good activity would be spending time going through those and thinking about that and praying it in and speaking to God about it, asking him to help you to believe that and receive it and live it. I think this is part of the reason the poor can say rejoice always because they are worth rejoicing about. Remember who you are. Your identity and these promises are permanent. They are true. And you know, they do not change based on our present circumstances or our feelings. Our feelings aren't always to be trusted We are fickle. So often we don't believe our identity because of our feelings. I actually don't feel very holy. I don't feel like I'm adopted. And I don't feel precious and loved. Our feelings aren't always helpful. They can be. But it's not always about what we feel. Those promises are not, they don't change based on our circumstances. Paul knew who he was. Do you? Meditate and read upon these scriptures. They will give you life and encourage you. Second point, there is a battle outside. It's not just because of the wind. The enemy, and sometimes I think we spend far too much time listening to what he's whispering in our ears. He hates these promises. And you and I often believe (coughs) these lies and don't realize the lies that we actually believe. I think some lies we've internalized. And I think that's one of the reasons why, because it's always chipping away at those You're not good enough to be a Christian. You're going to fail. God can't really love you. God isn't good. 
He doesn't really have good plans for you. Those are the lies that are continuously being whispered in our ears, or, which is even worse, other people are listening to them, and then they tell us them. There's something worse than perhaps other people telling us those things. Just like when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, the enemy tries to drive a wedge between ourselves and our heavenly Father. That's really what the wilderness is. That's what Satan was trying to do. He knew that Jesus and the Father were one, and so he wanted to divide them. And then Jesus would have been weak, and he couldn't have done the things he could have done. So he's definitely going to do it to us. He wants to drive a wedge between you, your, you and your relationship with the Father. A wedge between those promises and you. Don't believe the lies. Believe God's promises instead. And it's a choice that we have to make daily. And we need to learn to recognize when lies are spoken over us. And we need to get our battle armor on each day, which is Ephesians 6, 10, 18. The armor of God. I know some people pray that every day. They pray each one of those pieces of armor, the best breastplate, the helmet, the shield and the sword, the belt, the shoes. They've all got spiritual meanings. Pray those in. Get your battle gear on. Paul knew who he was. He knew who the enemy was. And he got his battle gear ready. And he was standing firm in the Lord. That's why he could rejoice. I can do all things in God, Christ who strengthens me. Paul knows he's weak. So he's trusting in God's strength. Number three. We are to be a fellowship of believers. We are not to be lone wolves or warriors. We need the help of others. Now, Paul, yeah, Paul was never by himself. He wasn't locked in that prison by himself. The Philippian church had sent some people to come and help him. He had Timothy, he had Silas. There were always people around him. He didn't wander around by himself. He needed the encouragement and help of his brothers and sisters in faith. Yes, Christ was his strength, but what about his other brothers and sisters? And I think sometimes we're not very good at that, in asking for help. That's probably one of my weaknesses. Paul's church loved Paul, and they were moved to support him financially. Paul also had Timothy, as I said, to take care of him. We too at Christ Church need to take care and be concerned for each other's needs. As part of God's family, we have other Christian believers as our brothers and sisters. Families should look out for each other. They should love one another. I'm not saying all people do this, and maybe one of the criticisms on myself. We're not always very good at, as I say, asking for help. We have our church face on, and everything is all right. I'm not saying everything needs to be broadcast to the church. That's why home groups are really good. Or we have prayer partners. There are people we need to be truthful to and be honest and say, actually, I need some help. Actually, I'm going through this. It's a real tough time. I don't necessarily need to tell everyone in the church. I'm not asking for that. But we do need the love and fellowship of other believers who can pray with us and encourage us and support us, just like Paul. Paul talks about our gentleness needs to be evident to all. 
So we need to be gentle with each other. And that's why he was broken hearted when those two sisters in the Philippian church, which I think you, Joy said amazingly, <laughs> there you are, you're at the back there, Eudia and you said, I, Sai Chi, you said it in another way, but it was nice. I think yours way was nice, but I can't remember it. Eudia and Sai Chi, he was broken hearted. He doesn't like when there isn't unity within the church. He said, I plead with these two ladies to agree with each other in the law, in the Lord. Yes, we're not going to agree on everything with each other, but we do need to be loving and gentle with each other. Let us be like Christ and humble ourselves. And notice that Paul does not take sides. Someone's obviously wrote him a letter, he's told him about this situation, and he didn't take sides. but he encouraged people to promote reconciliation. Those who were close at hand to promote reconciliation with each other. Now David Watson, who inspired and led church growth in St. Michael's uh, Le Belfry in York, those of you who went to New Wine last year, that was the church that led the presence venue Now, when he retired, he, was, he wrote a book and he looked back on his time as a church leader and some of the painful fallouts that he experienced within the church or the fallouts that happened within the church. And he wrote the following. It never helps to apportion blame. The whole sad saga was a vivid and painful reminder that however renewed individuals or churches may feel, we are still sinners and in constant need of the Lord's forgiveness, patience, and love. We still hurt one another. He goes on to say, sometimes unbelievably so, and still have to go on forgiving one another as many as 70 times seven. And I think we need to kind of get into a habit of that about being gentle, we need to be forgiving, not to say take sides, and be merciful. We are going to make we are going to make mistakes in our actions and our words. We've got to keep on forgiving, even if it's seventy times seven. So let us continue to be a forgiving church. Let us continue to be gentle and loving. Church unity needs to be worked at. It doesn't just happen. It's a bit of a pity one, that, isn't it? <laughs> we have to work at unity. But it's worth having. You know, Jesus, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit were one. That's the model. That's the unity there. We need to work at it. Fourth, we have a heavenly father who hears us and strengthens us. This is why Paul could um, say, rejoice always. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. Do not be anxious about anything. I'm going to ask Joy to come up. She gave a word of encouragement this morning. And I think it really fitted in with this. No, not to be anxious. The Lord is near. Do you want to come up? And... It'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. Our life is a journey. And um, I've been on a journey, and this week it's been a, a really powerful journey. As I've been studying and reading and praying, two very strong words kept on coming into my heart and my mind. One was faith. Never give up. Just never give up. No matter how low or things seem, just don't give up. And the other one was hope. If we haven't got hope, then we've got nothing. My hope is in 
Jesus Christ. The more I study his word, and I'm still on a journey, a very long journey, but the more he comes into my life, the more I'm able to see him in a different light. So all I would say to you is that he put on my heart this morning that just tell these people here in your church never to give up. Keep faith. We can't see, but if you have faith, you get the answers and never give up on hope because we are here and we are saved by the Almighty. Thank you. That stands firm, yeah. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. So what should we do? In everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends understanding, will guard our hearts. We were talking about this in home group. Guard our hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Anxiety and prayer are two great opposing forces in Christian experience. We have a God who listens to us. He says in everything, in prayer and petition and thanksgiving. It's that relationship. God is our father. Jesus is our holy brother and sister. Let's be thankful, present our requests to God. And we present them, and then we trust him. And we ask his will to be done, and the Lord will, we, to trust the Lord. He knows how to deal with the situation that we're in. If we need strength, he will give us strength. If there's a way out, he'll present a way out. He may draw people to us. He will comfort us and strengthen us also. Sometimes we pray and, ho- and hold on. <clears throat> it's praying and trusting. You don't necessarily just have to pray about it once. We can pray about it again. There are things that I'm praying, particularly some people in my life, and the Lord doesn't seem to be answering. He is answering. But I just need to pray for those situations and trust to keep on praying about it, that God sees it all. He knows what's happening in those people's lives. He knows his kingdom purposes and his plans. I don't. So we pray continuously and leave it in the Lord. Trust him. That's, that's part of the deal. That's the relationship. The other thing I was going to ask, and it might be overrunning a little bit, as this is talking about prayers and petitions, has God been answering your prayers? Are there any testimonies of answered prayers in this church? Would you like to come and share some of those? Come on. Let's encourage one another. This is testimonies about encouragement. If the, if the Bible is saying this and Paul is saying this, where's the answer? Where's the, I want to say the evidence. I prayed for this, and the Lord did. Go on. We need to pray for ourselves. We need to pray for others. We need to trust God, who is our good Father, to take care of our needs. The real battle is in our hearts and minds, and we are to guard them in prayer and in Scripture. So drawing this sermon to an end, How does Paul encourage us to rejoice always? He says, remember who you are. You are a child of God. You are worth dying for. Believe and meditate upon God's promises. Be like that tree in Psalm 1 is planted by streams and it can endure the good and the tough times. Get our relationship and habits right. Let's guard our heart and our minds. Put on the armor of God daily. 
You belong to a family and fellowship of believers. Let's love, support, and hold up each other in prayer. Let us in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present our request to God. We have a heavenly Father whose promises, who promises to be always with us. I'm just going to invite you to stand if you wish. I'm just going to perhaps have a little bit of a ministry time. I'm just going to pray that poem that's in Philippians. And let's see where the Lord goes. So it's just a, perhaps an opportunity. You can stand up or sit down. But let's have an opportunity just to perhaps be still. Perhaps to receive. You may just want to put your hands out slightly just to be in a kind of physical way of just being open. The Lord can minister to in all sorts of ways, but it's helpful when we are open to the Lord. Our attitude should be the same of Christ. That's what Paul says who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance as a man, and he humbled himself, and he became obedient to death, even death on a cross, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and he gave Jesus the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So this is who we're coming before now. And we just, we invite you, Lord Jesus. We know you're here. And we just pray that by your spirit that you would move among us. And that you would meet with each one of us. And so we pray, come Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. You might want to say that in your, in your heart and just invite the Lord. Come, Lord Jesus. In the Gospels, it's often recorded that Jesus would often, keep your eyes closed, we're just going to come into receiving, but he often asked people what they wanted. What is it that you want from him? He didn't always presume. He asked them. And so I invite you now to ask what you want from him. What is it that you want
There's a great passage in here. Paul writes that we shine like stars in the universe. You. You shine like stars in the universe. You are God's image bearer. No wonder you shine. And you shine wherever you go. Even if you don't feel like it and you feel a bit dull at the moment, you shine And you'll continue to shine through this week ahead. Because the Lord is in you. And you are in him. He is shining through you. You are precious in his sight. You. You are precious. You are chosen before the whole creation was made. You, you were chosen. None of you are orphans. You are all adopted. You are heirs. What could be better than having God as your father? What could be better? He is a good father. And he knows how to look after and care for his children. He's the best of fathers. And he knows how to give good gifts. promises never to leave you or forsake you. There's no escaping from him. He's always with you to the very end. He. Well, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. So if you need strength in him, ask him, ask him to strengthen you. And you are worth dying for. Just you. You'd be enough.